Welcome to another exciting episode of America F1. Joining us today is Paul Schumann, all the way from Ireland. Scott Greenspan, all the way from the great city of New York. How you guys doing today? Hey, Sherm. Hey, Sherm. Hey, Scott. Paul. Today we're talking about the summer break. F1 news. There's so much news this week. We're going to be talking about a dumpster fire. That is Alpine. We're going to be talking about Jonathan Wheatley, who has left Red Bull. I mean, who hasn't left Red Bull right now? I mean, it, maybe he, just the janitors left. I don't know. But everyone's going. Everyone's going. Everyone, it's the Roach Motel, and everyone's leaving. And then we also have the McLaren Renews Principal Andre Stella's contract. And we're going to talk about that. And was that a good idea? You know, that's a good subject to start out with. Scott? Why don't you take it away and talk about why Andrea Stella might not have been the right principal to sign? I mean, mixed feelings in terms of car performance. He's a genius. He's known as one of the best engineering minds in F1. And he really has lifted what was a midfield team into a top team. So, yes, he probably should have. But uh, you are starting to see signs where McLaren is becoming essentially the Ferrari of 2022. In 2022, they have the best car, just like Ferrari did two seasons ago, and they are repeatedly squandering wins and points with bad strategy and bad organization. What do I mean by this? Mercedes, which does not have the best car, has won the last three out of the four races. Lando Norris is squandering pole positions. He's making mistakes. Both Lando and Oscar have blown pit stops by overshooting their marks. Lando in Silverstone cost him the win. Oscar in Spa probably cost him the win. And you're seeing strategic mistakes, the wrong tires, for example, in Silverstone. So very strong in car development, weak in race operations. He may be the next Mattia Bonotto. Oh, wow. Whoa. Wow. Paul, what do you have to say to what just Scott just... <laughs> Dropped on everybody out there. Well, I mean, let's let's give Matteo his credit uh, for doing the news, and I'm sure other people have seen this. But of course, Matteo is going to be uh, joining. Um, oh, Mikey, what's the name of the team for next year? It's going to be it's going to be for Audi, isn't it? Audi, Audi. Audi. But I thought, but I thought, th I thought that Wheatley was also going to go to Audi as Wheatley. the team principal. So I was kind of confused when I heard the news. Mattia is joining as the chief operations officer and the chief ah. technical officer. The oh. way they're going to do it is it's going to be basically Mattia will focus on the thing that he's amazing at. And the thing, frankly, that Andrea Stella is amazing at, making the yeah. car fast. He's going to right. focus on the technical aspects of making the car fast, whereas Jonathan Wheatley is going to focus on the thing that I think, frankly, he's the best in Formula One at, race operation. But, we, but that's right. going to be later on. In the yep. show, we're going to really get to that. But right now, we're talking about McLaren and why maybe Andre Stella is maybe not the right guy. I mean, yes, he should have got a new contract. I agree with that. But they all, they do have issues. And if they've had the best car for the last six races, they've only won one, two of them. That means there's four races that they've left off the wayside and if you take another team and give them the fastest car like if you had lewis and george with the fastest car or even let's say if max again had the mm -hmm. fastest car of course he'd run all races so if you gave the fastest car to any of the other up the top teams paul don't you think they would have not squandered as many victories uh, i see your point here and i see scott's point with it um but first of all, I, I think that Andreas deserves the, uh, the the accolade to stay as the team Agreed. captain, the team manager. Um, I do think that McLaren have been making some mistakes. Um, do I think that they will fix them? Yes, I do. I hope so, because they seem to have the energy, the power in the car. The boys, the, the two racers, are, are giving it their all, and I do believe that in the right strategies. But there has been, I mean, as you exactly as Scott said, it... When it comes down to this, we're looking at a car that's quite good, 
and then strategies that are letting them down and occasionally things like missing their mark on, on pit stops, which is what it's, you know, that fraction of a second is what it's all about. So um, I don't think I blame uh, the team manager for this. I think I... I think it's a it's a matter for the whole team to fix. Uh, I was watching, sorry, just a sideline. I was watching an interview uh, with Mercedes the other day about how their pit stops have gotten faster, mm-hmm. and how they were saying, "Well, it's not just one thing. We have done everything. We fixed the tools. We fixed this. We fixed that, and everything gives that split second. Well, literally hundreds of a second, and that's why our pit stops are faster this year. So I think for McLaren, it's going to be the same type of thing. They just need to now buckle down and concentrate on the small stuff that really does add up to the entire package. And that is timing, strategies, uh, in and out of the pits, all that kind of stuff. Well, I find it fascinating, this whole thing. I I really do. Because I nerd out and get into the weeds on things like this. And in every sport, you have to be prepared to win. You can't just start winning. Like if if you compare it to like basketball or football, American football, sometimes the team will just get to the championship. They won't make it to the Super Bowl and they'll get to the championship a couple of times and then they get over that hump. And I think McLaren has not won for so long. It's been so long that they've been a winning constructor mm-hmm. that now that it's their time kind of not ready and they're kind of going through growing pains and so they might get this strategy wrong and then now oscar is a little nervous because now he's leading the race and he could get it a win and so he goes a little bit longer into his pit which they practice ad nauseum like a million times like a million and it's actually really amazing when you think about it that they can get on that little white line and get both tires on their time after time after time after time again when they're going through the pit lane and it's greasy and it's wet and they get on their mark but now it's time crunch now we're a winning team we could win the constructors and now all these things start to happen i think you're right i mean i think you're 100 percent right the team has been a midfielder forever i mean for decades unfortunately it's been several decades since it's really oh. been a player and This is new to them. You know, the people who were in charge of the team when it was very successful are long gone. I mean, we're talking, you know, McLaren was successful with Lewis and Ron Dennis and people like Fernando and people like that were on the team. And that's a long time ago. That's almost two decades ago. And since then, the performance has gone like that. And you're right. And they've got, you know, these people are largely all new. They're, they haven't been at the top, and certainly they've got the youngest driver pairing in the sport by a wide margin, and they're learning. And that doesn't mean that in a few years they won't be excellent. But, yeah, there's no question. If you gave that car to Max Verstappen, you'd have six wins. If you gave that car to Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes, you'd have six wins. Uh, you gave it to these young young people, and they have two wins because they squandered the other four. Scott, um, Scott, Scott's you know, playing our fantasy, our fantasy F1 that we played the other day with McLaren, if you remember. Uh, and we said, look, if you know, if it hadn't been Lando and Piastri, and it had been Alonso and Lewis, where would we be now for the the attempts they would have had? Would they have won the last four or five races? And the answer is yes, they would have, without question. So, is it that the two boys are? Well, we we also questioned Norris's current mental state, um, and we also think that Oscar is very balanced. Uh, but again, I think you're right. It is. Look, it's a team effort. At the end of the day, it is a team effort down to the last nut and bolt within a fraction of a second. And at the moment, whilst the boys are pretty much fighting hard with those cars, they are making mistakes with strategies and with uh, pit stops. So I think we should move that one along. It's not going to get any better until it does. <laughs> no. Now, Stella will get a grace period, but at some point, we won't. So. Now, we have Oliver Oaks just announced as the new team principal for the dumpster fire that is Alpine. I mean, Alpine has had so much turnover. Look at this. Look, I made this little meme. There's Alan Pross. Remember, he was on the team. He's gone. Omar Stammer, he was on the team. He's gone. Laurent Rossi, he gone. Permit, gone. Pat Fry, gone. Fernando, gone. Oscar, I mean, it is... Just... 
I don't really even understand. I got a. I have a phrase, and it's called the poison chalice. <laughs> and basically, the job for team principal for Renault Alpine Benetton, whatever you want to call it now. It's a poison chalice job. It will only last a certain amount of time, and you'll have your P60, your P45. You know, I don't know what you guys call it in the States, but basically, I would keep my exit card for, you know, the, the tax man right here in my top pocket every day with the expectation that I'm going to get fired, replaced, or run over. <laughs> Another one. Thank you. Another one. Thank you. I mean, go ahead, Scott. I mean, I think ultimately this is a team that's going to be sold. You're seeing that because they are moving from a constructor's team to a customer team. They announced it at SPA, Bruno Fahman did, the outgoing team principal, that they will no longer be a works team. They are not going to be making their power unit anymore. They're likely to be getting it from Mercedes. That has caused threats uh, by the French workforce in France to go on strike. In the power unit factory, that is correct. They may have labor unrest as a result. Um, and given that basically you're seeing Renault saying, we are not good enough to make a power unit. And frankly, they're not. Their power unit is much as 30 to 40 horsepower down from the others. Um, if Renault is basically throwing in the towel on being a works team, I think they're positioning this team to be sold. And if they're actually going to have only fans as their as their team, as their title sponsor, um, that to me is a concession that they just need some money, that Renault doesn't want to invest any money into it, that they're willing to have their Hollywood investors probably walk away or sue them because there's no way that these Hollywood celebrities and these sports stars are going to want to be associated with OnlyFans, and they probably are going to sue them as a result yeah. of this. They actually go forward. This is a team that is in absolute implosion mode. And to the point where they had to literally dig up Flavio Briatore from, from <laughs> the uh, bring him back. I mean, this is a guy that had a lifetime ban until the French courts said you can't do that because he'll never be employed again from the cheating scandal and crash gate. This is how desperate this team is. And this is in such dire straits. It's, it's the biggest dumpster fire in F1. Of course, Carlos Sainz ran the other way. And who did they get? They got the guy who, who's 36 years old, the young, second youngest team principal in the history of F1, who founded High Tech, the F2 team, the, the F2 and F3 team. And I really think you're looking at a situation where this team um, is not long for this world in its current format. Um, Andretti, if you're looking, maybe. It's <laughs> I hope Andretti and Cadillac come in and take over for Alpine. The thing is, that you learn in sports and the reason why the great teams are great is consistency no matter what you have to say about red bull christian horner's been there it's consistency they're really good at strategy they rarely make mistakes in the pit and consistent leadership you have to have consistent people in engineering and of course they take junior people to other teams so they can get you know more advantage and, and move up and make more money at that, that that that's what every sport but all the great teams in every sport consistent manager consistent philosophy consistent people and that's at every business and alpine is uh, they should probably teach this in mba classes this is what not to do this is what how not to run a business and I just I feel sorry for Pierre Gasly because I actually like Pierre Gasly and I'm wearing the Alpine shirt in memory of Pierre Gasly. Memory in memory. <laughs> oh my god, did he go up in the dumpster fire? <laughs> oh my I god. Absolutely. <laughs> I wish I had the tap. Oh sure. <laughs> Okay, so if I may, uh, you know, sometimes we we get the news and everybody jumps on the news and oh look here here he is Flavio Briatore and he's back and why the hell is he on the board at you know Renault at Alpine? What the hell's going on? Well, now the the dust is settling, and you know he is a billionaire in his own right. Um, he was behind many fashion brands being brought into many countries, 
and um, and he had a, a real passion for Formula One. He still does. Apparently, he's a real mover and shaker, and and has been for a long time. For those of you that don't know, uh, he was and only until recently he was Alonso's manager. Uh, but I, I'm talking like in the last couple of years is when he stopped being his manager. So I've got a funny feeling now that the dust is settling, and you know, exits from more team managers and new team managers being brought in. And as you say, Scott, and as you say, Sherm, that, you know, potentially this is, it's it's not about what this team is going to do. If they've already lost their manufacturing of their own engine and they become a, a non-manufacturing team, then maybe the whole point of uh, Briatori being there is so that they can bulk up this team, uh, you know, like do a fixer-upper on a house and then get it flipped. And that's probably why Briatori is there. And probably he still has remaining shares in there, which is why he went back. So segueing into the oh, main no. news that <laughs> Jonathan Wheatley has <clears throat> left or is leaving Red Bull to go and lead the Audi project. Now, this is, are the roaches leaving the motel? Are the ants all being exterminated? <laughs> what? is going on at Red Bull. Paul, your favorite subject, Red Bull, the wheels are falling off. And ma matter of fact, the wheels have fell, fell off. And now they're just scraping along down the straight. And you're going, wait, make sure that tire doesn't hit me on the way out. Don't let, your, don't let the door hit your butt on the way out. What's going on over there, Paul? Oh, it's, it's literally... I, I, I just cannot put it into words at this stage without being a bitch about Red Bull. I just can't do it anymore. You know, I, I have been saying now for, I think it's about three years, except for the wins, there is not a single piece of positive news has come from the doorstep of Red Bull. And this is, this is catastrophic. Adrian Newey, gone. Wheatley, gone. That's it. There's no, like, these were the people that sat shoulder to shoulder with Christian. There's got to be more to this story than meets the eyes, guys. It just This is starting to truly unfold in the format of contracts and walking. This is, you know, between the fact they're going to run their own engine next uh, in 2026, it's done. It's done. We are going to see them fall back down the grid now. I will say Scott, what I would like to ask you about this is, will this lead for Supermax for stepping to go to Mercedes. Well, if it's up to his father, he'd already be there. I mean, Yost wants him out. Uh, I mean, Yost made it very clear in March of this year that if Christian Horner stayed, in his words, the team will explode. And he, he was very emphatic. Uh, now, I, I want to be clear. I disagree a little bit with Paul about this particular departure. Um, and that is... Jonathan Wheatley has been the sporting director of Red Bull for 18 years. He's 57 years old. He is the bedrock of both their, their F1 leading strategy department that Anna Schmitz runs, as well as their best in F1 pit crew, the fastest average pit stops in F1. This is what the department said he has led. He also was the architect of Max Verstappen's 2021 win in Abu Dhabi, which gave him the championship. He was the voice who convinced Michael Massey on the radio to break the rules, in my opinion, and to finish under racing conditions rather than under safety car. Mm. Um, he is a brilliant uh, man when it comes to the rules. But he has wanted to be a team principal for years. And this was his big shot, not to be a subordinate, not to be under somebody's thumb, but to be the boss at the works team of one of the biggest car companies in the world, the VW Group. That's Porsche, Audi, Lamborghini, Bugatti, VW. He would have left even if Red Bull didn't have problems because this Maybe. is the opportunity of a lifetime. Okay. And anyone with any ambition in F1 taking this job. That's that's really good. News. Just like James Valls left Mercedes, he was being groomed to succeed. Because at, at sooner or later, you want to be the boss. If you're under somebody for 18 years, as you say, and you're given the opportunity to run your own ship, well, you're going to step up and run your own ship because there becomes a time where you, you're tired of being the co-captain and you go, okay, I'm going to take what I've learned from 
the captain and I'm going to take the things that I didn't like from the captain and I'm going to go and make it better somewhere else. And every person who's in those heights, whether you're a vice print principal and you want to be the principal, you're a vice president, you want to be the president. You want your opportunity to lead and show what you can do. And so I applaud Jonathan Wheatley for taking this step because I say it. Paul says it. You say it. You better watch out for Audi. You better watch out. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 100 percent. As I said, I've said I said again, um, Audi entering Formula One, ignore it at your peril. That was my 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 line, and um, I have to say, Scott, there was a good argument. You really should consider being a lawyer. <laughs> it just came out of nowhere, and it was really good. And I actually, you know, you got me convinced, and and you you made me sort of like detract from my like dislike of Red Bull. Sort of, I can't wait for the wheels to come off. And you were like, no, 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 I'm going to put some context in this and explain it to you. And I'm like, oh, damn, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a devastating blow to them, though. I'm not saying that the team isn't in trouble. I think the effect of it is devastating. But but, the, okay. So how, it isn't because Christian got his hand caught in the cookie jar doing bad things. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. But Red Bull is in serious trouble, right? They've lost the last four races. Their leading constructors has evaporated from more than 100 points to 42. They are in trouble. They retain somebody who does not belong in a top team anymore. Who is washed? Yeah. Okay, so so can we broach on who we believe Red Bull are going to promote to you know to Wheatley's position? Because so far, uh, Christians have to come back with a sort of statement of going, well, we'll announce it later, which means I don't think he was really ready or prepared that Wheatley was going to go. And I know he's got knock on yet, but he they've already said he's going to go on gardening leave before he joins the Audi team. But the Audi don't care. They don't need him until 2026. The <laughs> Timeline, just so you know, is he finishes this year, he will join Audi in about July of 2025, according to the uh, Who do yeah. I think we're going to promote? I hope they promote Hannah Schmitz. Yeah, she's brilliant, actually. Yeah, she's actually very good. She's a very good strategist, and uh, um, it would be great to see that. But I don't know if that's her field. I don't know the, if the whole thing would be her field. I, I don't know if he would trust her with that. We'll now, see. speaking as a cleaner, so to say, cleaner meaning the person <laughs> that comes in to clean up your mess, not just at your house, but for your business and for oh. all your PR mistakes. I, if I was Red Bull, I would hire a woman, whether it's Hannah or some other woman, to oh. clear up all that <laughs> mess at, because. That will be the smart PR move to do because point. we've had these problems in the past with Christian Horner. Now we're, we're repenting. We, we found Red Bull Jesus. And what we're going to do is bringing in a woman to lead this train. And now everyone will say, OK, well, maybe maybe we'll give it a shot. Maybe Red Bull has changed their ways. That's what I would do. Scott? Yeah. Just that she's already the head of probably you know, one of the two most important departments that falls under Wheatley's operations now. She's already the head of the strategy department. Mm-hmm. You don't think she knows the rules of F1? I think she knows the rules of F1. Now, does she know pit stops? She certainly knows the timing involved from her strategy uh, days. Uh, I think she's I think she's a pretty logical choice. Now, as we start to conclude our episode of summer break and the F1 news. We want to share with you something really exciting. All you race fans out there, Scott has been living the dream of every car fanatic out there. Whether you like formula one, whether you like NASCAR, whether you like IndyCar, it doesn't matter. Scott got the chance to drive the Nuremberg ring. This is every Sports fanatic, every car fanatic's dream. Scott, take us through that. Oh, I mean, put us in your body right now and tell us how that experience was. Sure. I, it was actually it's my, sec- I, my second time on the ring. I was on the ring maybe five years ago. So this time I went to RSR uh, uh, Newburgh, 
It's headed by a guy named Ron uh, Simons, who's very, very famous for the ring. So rented a 718 GT4 RS White Sox package and uh, did a bunch of laps around the ring. The reason I was doing it was I'm going to be taking the Manthai Racing Porsche Track Experience's Master Race Car course at Spa in September in the race car version of the 718, the 718 GT4 RS Club Sport, because uh, I graduated the driving academy through the professional level. And so Manthai Racing was kind enough to let me drive their race cars. So I'm not a big Cayman driver. I've been a 911 turbo owner for years, fairly recently. And so I'm familiar with 911 driving dynamics, but not 718 dynamics. So I wanted to see what it was like to get in the car before I went in the race car. So that's what I did. So I've got a couple of track days at Spa and the helmet, the Hans device, the racing suit. I have all that stuff. Now, so, out of the great turns they have at the Newburn Ring, a lot of them are blind. Which, what are your... What was your most challenging turn? And tell me how the other cars, because, I mean, they'll let campers drive on this thing. I mean, everything's driving there. So Every. tell me about that experience and tell me what your hardest turn was. And then did anybody who, who, who had a camper or a van, did any of those pass you? I saw, <laughs> I saw Econo boxes that had like two cylinders. I saw motorcycles in the in the two and a half hours I was on the ring. There were three major accidents. Um, you get people who are great racing drivers, and you get people who've never been on track before, who don't know the rules, who don't know German. It's a German highway, and there are very strict rules. Except there's no training required to get on, and so a certain percentage of the people do not know those rules. So you're always taking a risk. Um, in terms of turns, like I love the carousel turn which are the two turns where you go like 180 degrees or more and you have to go to the bottom. The scariest turns are not turns. It's that it's filled with blind crests where you do not know where your instructor is telling you to go flat in a 500 horsepower car. And you have no, and you're doing 100, 200 KPH, 250 KPH. And you have no idea what's on the other side of this rise. You have, it could be a sharp turn on the other side of this rise and your instructor is yelling at you to go flat. And the Newburgh Ring is a roller coaster. It is not flat. It is constantly doing this. It is constantly rising and falling and turning. It is like no other track in the world because you do not know where you're going 80% of the time. You know what I'm going to do after this podcast is over? I'm going to go back into the archives on F1 TV and watch a race at the Newburgh Ring because that experience must have been incredible. And I also know that you have a special helmet that you had made and i want you to show everybody that helmet and maybe talk a little bit about it in the process of it because it's a beautiful work of art have sure. you seen this helmet paul i have i actually have i admire this helmet this is what sparked our conversation about the cost of an f1 helmet recently and uh, scott was able to give us a, a bigger insight as to how much uh, an f1 helmet can be which is i think close to 20 grand uh, with including paint this wow. is not an F1. Move it over to 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 your right. Yes. Now show everybody what. Wait, this helmet. Look at this. Describe this helmet for us, Scott. This is America. America, <laughs> baby. America. It's a Stilo helmet. Uh, it is, which is an Italian manufacturer. Uh, actually, Lance Stroll rolls in a Stilo helmet. Uh, a lot of the GT racers do. It's probably the most popular helmet in WEC uh, and IMSA. It, this and Bell for F1. It's definitely Bell. Um, this is carbon fiber helmet. It weighs three pounds. It's special order only. It takes about four months to make. Uh, it's made in Italy. Uh, and um, you the have to put it right in the middle because right now I can't see the helmet. Yeah, you yeah. gotta, Scott. You gotta bring it right in and then gently. Yeah, now lift it up a little bit, Scott. There you go. Show everybody. <laughs> and it's an eagle. Describe what's on it. So it's got an eagle painted on it. So America uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> this is designed by Jens Munzer Design in Germany, JMD. They are the people who make all of Max Verstappen's helmets, who, who designed and paint all of Max Verstappen's helmets. They made all of Michael Schumacher's helmets, all of Sebastian Vettel's helmets, all of Daniel Ricciardo's helmets, all of Lando Norris's helmets, all of Nico Hulkenberg's helmets. Um, so when you're not an F1 driver, you have to wait about six months for them to make your helmet. Uh, but it's well worth it. Uh, it's a very uh, collaborative process. You don't tell them to design you a helmet. You will not get them. They want to know from you what designs you want, uh, what colors you want, 
And then they start sending you drawings and you go back and forth with them for months before you get a helmet and you have to be patient. Now, is your visor red? Is that a red visor? It is. It is. I also have a clear visor for uh, low light days. Uh, yeah. And uh, beautiful. Yeah. So, so that's sort of what it is. And, but it, it's got everything. It's got, it's got a communication port, you know, over here, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's got now, a communication port. One towards. question I have to ask you about something. when they make this helmet for you, is it made like small, medium, large, or do they actually come and like grab your head and fit it in some, some, some type of mold or something? You measure your head, but only F1 drivers generally get custom made helmets. Um, it comes in multiple sizes, and then the cheek pads here uh, are mm -hmm. custom. -able. You can get different. Stilo lets you get different size cheek pads. Uh, so these are customizable. I needed a size 59, but I needed a thinner cheek pad. This red interior is custom. It normally comes in black. If you're in the United States, you can only get this interior in black, and I didn't think that worked. So I bought this from a comic shop at the Newburgh mm -hmm. because in Europe, they will sell you a custom interior where I thought that really black was more, I thought red sort of fit the ethos of this helmet much better. This is a helmet for GT racing, not for open cockpit. This is a bigger eye port and it doesn't have advanced ballistic protection. If this was an F1 helmet, it would have a narrower eye port and Kevlar and other materials to prevent a Felipe massive incident occurring from a spring or other metal penetrating into your brain. Uh, but other than that, it's the same 2009 Massa. Yeah, it's it's like three pounds, um, and it's about sixty percent of the cost of an F1 helmet. Um, but it, and it takes about three to make it. You would have to wait about three or four months to get it. And and can we just say that Scott does this for fun? <laughs> He's not. That's not. That is not what he does for a living. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's it's not. That's, I like for fun. that's an amazing helmet. And it, it it's beautiful. It's a it's a work of art. And yes. when you're not driving with it, I hope you put it on a mantle somewhere. It's definitely it's a locking piece. Yeah. You put oh, it in your it goes in a it goes in a case. It, it, it absolutely doesn't do that. If you drop this helmet, you can't use it. You can spend six thousand dollars on a helmet, thirty five hundred dollars more to paint it. If you drop this helmet, you cannot use it. It's gone. So this goes right back in its protective case. Second, I'm done here. I hope it's in a protective case that people can see. It's a yeah, it's and his hands device. Look, and he got wow, the hands device. Look, he got the hands a, device. Is it this, graphic? This is a feather light. The same is it one. Carbon. Carbon. Is yeah, it a carbon this, one? This is carbon fiber. It's the same one that all the F1 drivers use. It weighs 11 how, ounces. How much, Scott? How much are the hands devices? Um, an, an inexpensive Hans device will be three fifty to four hundred. A feather light is eighteen hundred. Oh. The, the most that's actually very reasonable, yeah. That's actually, yeah. It weighs eleven ounces, and there is such a difference. Hold on, Scott. Hold on, gentlemen. So, Scott, can you tell us, please, um, the purpose of Hans device? Okay, so um, it is the the idea is that in the event of shock damage, it actually keeps the body more rigid. Or can you just tell us a little bit about the Hans device? Solely, it prevents. It has one purpose, and it's to prevent, prevent a basilar skull fracture. So what 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 it does is it it clips to your helmet and then yeah. belts go over it here in your harness and your body's already restrained but in the event of an accident if your your head would 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 literally do this and and your your, your spinal cord would snap and you would die that's how Gail Arnold died so what this does is it straps to your helmet with Hans clips and your head will only go about this much before it will stop and that's what it does it prevents your neck from moving too far forward to save you from a basilar skull fracture. That is the only purpose. The main, no, that's, the main that's, growth that's not having is that is what killed Dale, Dale Earnhardt, right? Yep, Dale Earnhardt Jr. died from, from this. Uh, so did Roland Ratzenberger the day before Michael Schumacher. He also died of a basilar skull fracture. That wow. is the purpose of this, of, of this wonderful little invention is to prevent a basilar skull fracture. Right. And Basically, when you're wearing this, when you're wearing this and you're in the car, et cetera, can you feel it kind of keeping you in line? You can't turn your head more than about this much, or you can't move your head more than about this much down. So when you talk to the one drivers and you say they should be doing this to see people, they can't. So when they're being released from their pit box, they yeah. need their mechanic to tell them to stop because they 
physically cannot do this. Yeah. This is what's going on. Because and a helmet would reduce that vision anyway. I've worn plenty of helmets. I've done plenty of track days. And a, a helmet, even a crappy, you know, cheap one, you, you can't see. I mean, like it's motorbikes, I, motorbike riders as well. Like they just, they don't have that full effect to see what they're doing. And with one of these, not only is the eye port narrow, but you can't move your neck more than about this much. Wow. Well, that was some great information. And for the, all the viewers and listeners out there, we were talking about the devices that are safety devices to help drivers avoid serious incidents and have to go to the hospital and in some cases, unfortunately, death. And I think at this time, F1 is probably the safest it's ever been in the history of F1 because you can see some Remember a couple of years ago, we had Wow Zhang Yu, where he had that massive incident and his car was just crumpled up in mm. between the barrier and the fence. And he walked away from that incident. Yeah, the roll bar yeah. failed. Actually, the roll hoop failed, but um, the halo saved his life because it, it did not fail. And it, it's not even designed as a roll bar, but it prevented his head from being crushed. His network. So I want to thank Paul and I want to thank Scott for coming in and giving some great information about what's going on in the summer break. And also Scott for sharing his experience at the Norberg ring, which is every driver, every car fanatics fantasy, Scott, Paul, thank you thank as you. always. And everybody out there, keep on racing everybody it first impressions uh we did uh, two laps and then they closed the track i noticed that Somebody there was a little red car that had an great. accident there was a yellow flag yeah we, we don't know what happened they closed the whole track well they took a little yellow car a red car on a trailer yeah we saw that accident we went past it twice mm -hmm. we went past it twice